All right. I am now joined uh, by Slavoj Žižek uh, coming back to uh, to the show after uh, I don't think it's been that long, but it's been a little while. No, no, no. I feel at home, my God. I feel at home <laughs> there. You know, we, at your, I mean, at your give them an argument place. Although <laughs> I no longer remember what the arguments are, but you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, shooting. Yeah. Stop shooting. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, well, we are. You just wrote a book, uh, uh, "Freedom: A uh, yeah. Disease Without Cure," and I thought it might be interesting before we start talking about politics to get into some of the more philosophical aspects of uh, of what you're you're writing in the book. Uh, I did have a very specific question about it, but before I get to that, do you want to just kind of give people a general sense of what you're doing in this book? You know, uh, many people maybe will not be satisfied because, as you said, I really try to address the fundamental questions about the status of freedom, but in both directions, not only politically. What could freedom mean today? What does it mean to be free, actually, and so on? Uh, Here I complicate things. We can immediately go into it. But uh, also on this more, no, nothing is more fundamental than society, but let's say Mm -hmm. lower level, more elementary level, what does it mean freedom Mm -hmm. in view of uh, today's cognitive science, scientific research, and so on? Because as most of our viewers and listeners probably know, the main thesis is that freedom is, they like the term, user's illusion. Mm-hmm. So you may, they admit intelligent scientists that, of course, there are acts or moments when you feel free. But they claim feeling free just means that your desires, intentions, which can be totally naturalistically determined, are not thwarted. You can do what you desire, but you are not free in choosing what you desire. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is not just a theoretical point. That's an interesting insight made, although now I almost less and less disagree with him politically by the big bestseller guy Yuval Harari. No? Mm -hmm made this point, which is a simple one, but intelligent, that till now, with all this DNA or manipulations of our brain and so on, these debates about freedom, are we really free or not, were mostly purely academic debates. Mm -hmm. For example, one can get a cynical double example. Take a Deridan or pseudo Lacanian deconstructionist who tells you you don't have a unique self, you are not speaking, you are spoken by language, dissenters, blah, blah, blah. But nonetheless, the way they speak, when they argue, they act as if they are free beings <laughs> who say what they want to say. So it, it didn't change our everyday self experience. Mm. But with these direct scientific interventions into brain. This is, this, do we, are we free or not? It's no longer just an abstract theoretical question. It's a question which concerns our daily life. To what extent are we already controlled? To what extent we will be controlled? What, as I already tried to develop in detail, mm-hmm. what what is really ominous and what the Chinese are already doing. But at the same time, I must add, don't focus on Chinese. You know, we often uh, uh, focus on China as it's the worst possible. We are doing the same, just at a little bit more refined, but refined means here invisible, not so transparent level, you know. So uh, here... It's a nice point. Now I will make professional propaganda. Why philosophy is so important. We live in a unique time where 
this question, which was still now considered uh, an abstract philosophical question, do we really have a free will or not, blah, blah. No, this is becoming a question that has effects on our daily life. And I think this question has to be answered directly because many leftists see in artificial intelligence and so on a threat to our freedom. But their reaction is simply, so let's limit it, contain it, control it, and so on. But beneath all this, there is a question which is not uh, nonsensical. It is the question, but forget about social domination and control. Are we as animals, speaking animals, within the, are we fundamentally free or not? And uh, I try to grapple with this point. Here then enters quantum physics and all of that. But on the other side, of course, I raise also the question of uh, uh, freedom in social sense. There, I think I bring something at least moderately new. My first point is, is this opposition that I elaborate following Hegel between abstract and concrete freedom. First, as a good materialist, I emphasize that freedom is not simply opposed to necessities, not natural necessities in the sense of obeying rules and so on. We can be concretely free only within a certain set of rules. Let me give you an example. What the two of us, what we are doing now, we can talk freely. Why? Because subconsciously, okay, me less than you, but we know English language, we obey its rules. And precisely obeying these rules makes us free to talk the way we talk. Imagine that we would have to negotiate all the time what the rules are. In some totally abstract sense, we would be more free, but it would be a totally suffocating freedom. So based on this, I try to elaborate a couple of points. First, I think what in one of our past sessions, it's a very simple point. We already talked about how here I think we who still want to be some kind of socialists, whatever we call it, not so much we not so much oppose liberalism, but go a little bit deeper and uh, fully accept the fact that our freedom need to be embedded in certain so social circumstances to our, for our freedoms to be actual freedoms. You know, for example, I don't know if I mentioned it in this book of mine, but that was the problem with, it was very limited, but nonetheless, it was a minimal something, Obamacare. Remember what was the right-wing populist counterpoint. Ah, so now the state will prescribe to us, to each doctor, blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, this is the general tendency, and it's an ingenious trick of, let's call it bourgeois ideology, to present us new actual limitations of our freedom as new freedoms. You know who is the best example here? He's almost my favorite guy. You know, when I say this, I mean pure horror, of course, no? You know, uh, this guy, Millet, the new Argentinian president, he brought the notion of freedom to the end. You know, when he was asked how to help the poor, he said, by extending our freedoms to make it fully legal to sell your children and your organs. In some abstract sense, this is a freedom, but thanks for such a freedom. So my point is this one, uh, that 
if you look, sorry, I don't hear you do something. Hello? Oh, sorry. I, I just yeah. said it's a certain kind of freedom uh, yeah. from uh, from limitation, you know, from constraint. But it's uh, but if uh, if what you care about is freedom from domination or uh, or ability to sort of conduct your life as uh, as you would like, uh, then yes, the idea of a world where people are, I suppose, selling their organs for Bitcoin so they can, you know, make rent uh, is seems like a, about as extreme a form of domination as I can imagine. Yeah. Um, so I did just want to briefly, if it's okay, uh, circle back to uh, the uh, more philosophical point that you yeah, uh, that you started with um, about before you started talking about social freedom, you know, when you were talking about uh, freedom in general and you were talking about uh, the sort of classical kind of uh, freedom and determinism, issue and uh mm -hmm. and what what i want to ask about here is i was a little bit curious about how some of what you said about it in this book lines up with some of what you'd said uh before because you uh in in this book you you'd sort of talk about you seem to take very seriously the idea that these challenges from physics really make it seem yeah. like uh uh, you know, maybe we we just don't have free will at all. You you sort of frame it as as like uh, Pascal's wager, you know, kind of kind of issue to uh, to affirm that you know that we that we can be even in the face of it. Uh, whereas I remember in uh, in a previous uh, your previous book, uh, uh, one like I don't know, ten years ago, the less than nothing, uh, yeah. you'd uh, you'd you'd said something I always thought was interested in there. If it's okay, I just want to read this out. You said. Yeah, yeah. Uh, compatibilists such as Daniel Dennett have an elegant solution to the incompatibilist complaints about determinism. When incompatibilists complain that our freedom cannot be combined with the fact that all our acts are part of the great chain of natural determinism, they secretly make an unwarranted ontological assumption. First, they assume that we, the self, the free agent, somehow stand outside of reality. Then they go on to complain about how they feel oppressed by the notion that reality and determinism controls them totally. This is uh, what is wrong with the notion of us being imprisoned by the chains of natural determinism. We thereby obfuscate the fact that we are part of reality, that the possible local conflict between our free striving and external reality that resists it is a conflict inherent in reality itself. That is to say, there's nothing oppressive or constraining about the fact that our innermost strivings are predetermined. When we feel threatened by in our freedom by the pressure of external reality, there must be something in us, some desire or striving that is thus thwarted, but... Where do such strivings come from, if not that same reality? Our uh, free will does not in some mysterious way disturb the natural course of things. It is part and parcel of that course. For us to be truly and radically free, in quotation marks, would entail that uh, there's no positive content involved in our free act. If we want nothing external, in particular, to govern our behavior, then uh, this would involve being free from every part of ourselves, uh, what a determinist claims that our free choice is determined, that does not mean that our free will is sometimes constrained, somehow constrained, that we are forced to act against our will. What is determined is the very thing that we want to do freely, that is, without being thwarted by external obstacles. And so I, I, I was just curious if, if you know, in the years since since yeah. you'd written that, uh, if if your thinking about this has has shifted, and if so, kind of what caused that shift? I'm not aware, maybe I'm always too much immersed into what I'm doing now, and you from a slightly external perspective can see it, but, I'm, but my basic solution is an old mantra, too philosophical to go in detail into it now, but my point is that the moment you accept the standard naturalistic vision of reality mm -hmm. as something totally determined by natural laws. And if you include contingency, as in quantum physics, this doesn't take a lot. Because, you know, freedom is not contingency. Like, let us say you uh, decide, you say, I have to make a big decision now, but I will leave it to chance. E either a more subtle chance of how, of how, quantum superpositions will be, mm -hmm. uh, will fall into one determined reality, or more simple, which is not true chance, uh, idea of I will toss a coin, blah, blah, and so on. But this is not freedom. This is simple mm. chance. Freedom is not 
leaving it to chance. Freedom is a form of determinism. Freedom is, this is what I want to do, and I want to do it. It's not leaving it to chance. So uh, how can we think freedom? Freedom no. is a determination uh, uh, without becoming idealist, without mm. saying there must be another level which is outside material reality. And mm -hmm. at that level, in the domain of spirit, we are really free. You know what worries me here, me yeah. as an old materialist, that yeah. these big uh, disclosures, these big results, the last uh, uh, Nobel Prize for physics, uh, were precisely the guys who experimentally proved for Bohr against Einstein that two particles that you split, which are correlated, can somehow communicate faster than the speed of light. Uh, Classical experiment. Right, yep. Now it was more theoretical. Now it's definitely proven. But here our enemies, uh, New Age spiritualists enter. They say, ah, Einstein was right in his description of reality where nothing can move faster than the speed of light. If there is a communication faster than the speed of light between two correlated particles, then mm -hmm. this must be a non-material spiritual link. <laughs> so our material reality is not all that is and so on and so on. I try precisely to reject this. Okay, to cut a long story short, yeah. I think that, okay. yeah. that only quantum physics, but correctly interpreted with all these paradoxes, yeah. opens up a space for freedom, for what only with us humans emerges as free will. It opens up a space for it in natural reality itself, demonstrating that the image of natural reality as a wholly deterministic space is not true. And the beauty of it, I think, is that you don't need any uh, higher spiritual level here to operate with. You just have to accept. And now we come to the metaphysical beauty of quantum okay. physics. You know, now we live in a wonderful era. Till yeah. now, uh, for the last 60, 70 years, the so-called Copenhagen interpretation predominated. Right. The basic thesis of Copenhagen interpretation is, as we all know, uh, don't think, just calculate. Uh -huh. Copenhagen written simply prohibited, not even the metaphysical, in a this uh, ontological question. Okay. Quantum physics speaks about something, waves, oscillations, collapse of wave function. But what's the ontological status of this? Niels Bohr says, these are just our calculations. The only reality we know is the naive material reality. Naive in the sense that it uh. acts following our common sense. But now things are changing. I love this violent return of metaphysical questions. And you know what's the beauty of it? Yeah. The standard materialist notion is that reality is spatio-temporal. Object moves in time within space. These two basic coordinates. Now, it's beautiful. There is a big conflict between which is more primordial, space or time. It's a beautiful debate because uh, it's clear all, and I uh, and uh. In debate with some of them, quantum physicists, they all admit that if we man, uh, remain within the opposition of time and space, we will not find a solution. So the general opinion is one of the two will have to be abandoned. Abandoned in the sense that it's not an ontologically original dimension. Now, you Some have... Supervenes on the other one. Uh, yeah, yeah, so... yeah, 
Yeah. So, uh, so, 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 so okay. Are, ki, ki, okay. Sorry. So, sorry. Finish your point. No, no, no. My point is just that uh, Einsteinians yeah. are more for space. The idea is it's beautiful metaphysics that that time is just an effect of our cognitive limitation. Like I cannot see everything, all of let's say your room, so I need time to move from here to there. And it's much more complex, but the basic idea is that the reality itself already exists. Everything, what we perceive as past, future, and present in an atemporal block. Right. And that time is just because we are finite beings who cannot grasp it all. But then there are guys, my guys, who claim no, uh, time is the primordial dimension. And that here, of course, I enter with my speculations, time in the sense of antagonism, Hegelian negativity, and so on and so on. So, and then yeah, so, so, comes second. Yeah, so like I, I I mean, circling back a little bit, though, right? Like, on the face of it, you think, like, if if quantum physics is supposed to help with with free will, then, uh, you know, it's it's a little bit confusing as to how, because it seems like either, um, you know, like I think Bohr says at some point, you know, there are, like, hidden variables, and it's actually deterministic anyway. Oh, wait, or... wait, 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 wait. This is, you touched now a mega problem. The yeah. greatest of Bohr... Yeah. Is that he rejected hidden variables. Okay, okay. okay. So, 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 Einstein, so, we go, so Einstein right. says to account for all this, there yeah. must be hidden variables. Okay. And the so, beauty so, of Bohr so, is that precisely he daringly asserted an open universe. Okay. No, so, there are so, gaps so, in reality. Reality is incomplete. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, fair enough. Uh, I so if you say. Uh, that, uh, you know, reality is incomplete, Einstein's wrong, God does play dice with the universe. It seems like then the problem is with that one, then, you know, if if there's some sort of quantum randomness that, you know, yeah. filters up to decision-making yeah, yeah. the human brain, um, that doesn't really seem like what we want for free will. If there's just some quantum equivalent of a coin flip. No, uh, no I coin... agree with you. Wait a minute. I'm here yeah. very careful. Okay. I'm not saying that free will is at the same level as, as quantum contingency oscillations. I'm just saying that in order for free will not to be just a user's illusion, mm -hmm. then somehow reality must not be totally predetermined. Reality must be open. Now, this is, we are far from free will, but yeah. in a negative way, if you take the traditional naturalistic notion of universe as a close deterministic complex, then obviously there is no space of free will. Well, it's not obvious to everybody, right? This is the, I mean... How can you do it? Tell me how. Uh, well... I mean, you be a compatibilist. This is the position you seem to be endorsing in less than nothing. That the uh, that uh, that uh, you say that uh, that you know you deny that uh, not being predetermined is uh, is a condition of free will. That you say free will or the kind of free will that we care about uh, the most might be something like, uh, for example, our uh, our capacity to. Uh, to consider alternate courses of action, to reflect on and be moved by reasons for and against, you know, those courses of action, et cetera. And that none of that is in conflict with free will that perhaps, if, sorry, none of that is in conflict with uh, the assumption of a uh, of physical determinism that if you, the same, that perhaps if you have like, uh, if your conception of, you know, if what you think, you need to be in order to be free in the ways that might matter, yeah. certainly for uh, for uh, moral evaluation, uh, for responsibility for your actions. Uh, if you think that what you need to be free uh, in order to be free in that way is this kind of uh, radical freedom from uh, the laws of physics, then sure, you know, uh, you know, maybe you need this quantum indeterminacy. But I, I wonder, is that really the kind of freedom that matters on a human level? 
No, but this, I think okay. that uh, yeah. it does. Maybe I okay. change my position okay. because I think that the position that if I got you correctly, you sure. advocate now is yeah. the position that even with if we are at some basic ontological level, just mechanisms. Yeah. I mean, uh, 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 yep, automatic yep. mechanisms determine blah blah. Uh, at the level of social life, we experience ourselves as free. Certainly, yeah. I think that's not enough. Well, but it's, not, it's, it's it's not just that we experience ourselves as free. I want to be really clear about that, right? Because it's because uh, somebody could say, I agree that that's not very interesting. If all we say is, uh, well. Uh, it seems as if we're free or maybe it's like a useful illusion rather than a useless one to say that we're free. Uh, if that's all you say, then, uh, then I agree. That's, uh, you know, like, yes, I, I agree that that's uh, that's a very limited interest, but, uh, but the, the, you know, my question is, is it actually the case that in order to be free, like in other words, in, to, in order to objectively be free in the way that matters, you know, there's surely lots of different kinds of freedom or senses of freedom, and, and yeah. I would deny that some of them uh, conflict uh, with the assumption of determinism. But uh, could it be that to, you know, in order to be free in the way that matters for moral responsibility, for something objectively being your fault or to your credit, you know, when you do it, that for that, for that, right, that the kind of freedom that matters might be. Uh, not so much freedom from causation, you know, freedom, freedom, you know, freedom from the laws of physics, uh, but this kind of freedom to determine the course of your life through, as I say, um, you know, being, uh, you know, these capacities to understand and be moved by reasons for and against different courses of action. That seems to be what separates us uh, from other kinds of animals that we wouldn't necessarily think are, you know, are, are free in that way. Uh, it seems to be the kind of sense in which when we think that people aren't, uh, aren't responsible for their actions uh, because they couldn't help it because they're severely mentally disabled, for example, that seems to be the kind of freedom that they, they seem to lack. Right. So, so, so I, I, I think the kind of compatibilism that's interesting and I, and I agree. And I, I, I have problems. I see your okay. point. Now, yeah. Really. I have problems with compatibilism because still it doesn't explain how the two levels that you treat as compatible relate to each other. Let's return to Daniel sure. Dennett, whom you mentioned. Mm -hmm. He, yes, he still insists that if we were to know reality more completely, we will be to we would be able to account for all our acts in terms of natural determinism. For him, he even uses sometimes this expression that it's some that the illu intentionality, like when you explain, he gives this example. If I ask you now to do something to turn off or on your light. The answer, why did you do that, would be because we communicate not at the material level and I ask you to do this. Mm -hmm. But then it says that a complete true explanation in the strict scientific sense would have been to describe this at a more elementary level, that I'm telling you something can be translated into how atomic, subatomic particles move, which affect you, and so on. You know, so that for Dennett, nonetheless, the language of intentionality, he gets a little bit ambiguous here, but his basic insight is that the language of intentionality is a kind of a useful simplification. It's mm -hmm. beyond the scope of our cognitive capacities to describe all up to the detail that goes physically on. But we are losing time here. I want to focus on another point. Sure. I agree with your central point, which is like, let's say you are oppressed, the police, uh, police or whoever beats you, bank foreclosed your account, blah, blah. So you are in deep shit. You have to do something. What? Has, can they do here 
this type of uh, uh, metaphysical speculations, are you really free or not? Here I see the danger of artificial intelligence, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, brain studies, and so on. But what if, and this field is advancing incredibly, what if through direct interventions into your DNA mm -hmm. or uh, some more primitive chemical implants into okay. your brain, we can, I can change your character to such a level that you would react differently to such challenges. This is not, ah. and this is far from, an, uh, this is far from an illusion. I read somewhere, this is the, I think I mentioned this in another of my books, some weird guy with Arab name, I'm not a racist here, just a, who has a big clinic in Berlin, Germany, yeah. already has a project. Instead of maternal womb, he has some kind of a transparent from glass and plastic artificial womb, and he demands from parents of a child, just give me sperm and all that stuff. And then before even the process of birth begins, which is all done in the lab, he gives you, it's pretty terrifying reading, 150 variations where you can make a choice. Not yeah. just physical, what color of an eye, how strong will you be, uh, color of your hair, how high, but also psychic properties. Will you be more decisive, aggressive? Uh -huh. Will you be more peaceful? And so on and so on. So, you know, here the problem for me enters because yeah. here, okay, you are screwed up by, yeah. by a bank, uh, whoever, police, a gang beats you, but how you will react to it can be already scientifically manipulated. Mm -hmm. So why is this important? Because I learned from my Chinese friends that Chinese biogenetics is focusing, already focusing on this. How to influence at the level of DNA and so on, how to change the what you are biologically, so yeah. that, to put it in official terminology, to be socially more constructive, not to protest too much, and so on and so on. So here I think that uh, what you are metaphysically like becomes important also in your social behavior. Yes, as you said, you will protest, but if I manipulate your brain enough, you will do a very benevolent protest or uh, uh -huh. even uh, uh, try to make people more submissive to social norms, you know. This, is, this has a long history already in Stalinist Soviet Union, mm -hmm. where they tried to, it was done at a much more primitive level. But the idea was that to be a dissident, rebellious behavior, is means something is wrong with your brain. And yeah. they tried to directly intervene into your brain. They treated politically active dissident stance, not as this is beyond the standard Stalinism, not your grandparents must have been bourgeois, bad influence. No, no. Simple, pure biological malfunctioning of your brain. These are, I think, the threats uh, today. But you know which is another thing, and let's conclude then if you want this philosophical part, which is important sure. for me. Yes, yes. It is, uh, it is this opposition between what I call abstract and concrete freedom. Mm -hmm. There are moments of here, if you are looking for my pessimism, you yeah. will find it here. But I point out that uh, there are moments of abstract freedom. These are revolutionary moments where precisely not all, we still speak the same language and so on, but 
many of basic rules of decency, of nonviolence break down. This is how I read that wonderful quote from Sartre, you know, when he said that already, although under German occupation, the terror was more or less complete, right. yep. in some sense, they were more free more than free, that. Yeah. Yes. Why? Precisely because, uh, because, precisely because there was no space for freedom within the existing set of rules imposed by the German occupier, you have to think more radically. But another thing here, which I find yeah. productive in the first half, more metaphysical of my book, yes. also when I emphasize the difference between uh, explicit, this is my eternal motive, explicit and implicit unwritten rules. Right. Yes. This is also very important. Freedom. Uh, this is today more important than ever. Freedom is not just enabled by a set of rules. But even for these rules to function, you have to obey many implicit unwritten rules, which are crucial. And maybe I remember when we had our previous conversations, we already uh, touched this problem. Take somebody like Donald Trump. Yes. He was not so much violating explicit rules right. as you know violating the implicit rules you had a certain law a certain rule uh, that uh, was evoked for example now he's again playing with this under certain circumstances the president has the right to declare emergency state to send the army on the streets and so on but the understanding was implicit understanding that you do this only where you had either a mega natural catastrophe and so on and so on. Trump, without breaking any direct law, mm -hmm. wants to take this much more seriously and simply say, when you have big leftists, even if they're peaceful demonstration, you, demonstrations, you send the National Guard and so on and so on. This is another big lesson, more than ever important today. But would you agree, and this brings us maybe to the second more political part, I'm so yes. sorry yes. for this. Uh, do, would you agree that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, why is all this abstract concrete freedom important today? Mm -hmm. Because till now, and I don't think this is a conservative point, yeah. Till now, with all political struggles and so on, yeah. we, at least most of us, agreed that we can be effectively free only as nonetheless sharing some sense of community. Like I argue for my argumentation, but I will not directly uh, start shooting at you or whatever, become directly aggressive. Now, Trump and his guys are openly advocating this option. They say, oh, so uh, you see the beautiful paradox. What we thought till now, that yeah. it was the domain of the left, we violate all the rules. The right is now doing this. They are all the time, not just Trump, but all those horrible guys. My God, with guys like this, I say, Maybe I'm against death penalty, but after <laughs> we kill these guys, you know. Are we, I, I mean, just be careful and listen carefully to sure. the language of the Santis, Trump, and so on. They Trump even at some point says that if the true people's will, which means voting for him, will not be respected, we have the right to violate constitution, all the laws, and so on and so on. He's talking as a wild revolutionary. It's another thing what he really wants to do, but I think that he is more and more ready to go pretty far here. You know, let's not how, forget how far, you, that, so how far do you think you would go? I mean, this is the, I, I mean, like, that's a genuine question. I have no idea. Um, I have no precise answer. I just think that maybe, why not? They are 
ready to go further than the 6th of January. 6th of January was simply badly realized. It was not well prepared and so on. Now he will try to do a better thing. Didn't First, didn't Trump already better in the cynical sense, better for him? For example, Trump, I, I think we already mentioned this once. I love this point. That yeah. Trump is well aware, this will be a nightmare for traditional leftists, but I like this point, that uh, you know that in on the 6th of January, yeah. in a subtle way, the army didn't play such a bad role because the army likes social stability. And I remember some high-ranked generals said openly, if Trump goes too far in uh, cancelling election, blah, 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 they will have to intervene. Mm-hmm. I think that, uh, that there are examples when when people, yo, my God, now I will sound really as a crazy leftist reactionary. When I mean, there is such a deep confusion among the people, the army, not by beating workers, but by guaranteeing a minimum of social order, can play a positive role. And then I went back and noticed how often the army played such a relatively positive role. For example, you remember, no, you don't, you are too young, but I do. When they overthrew in 1970s later, in Portugal, Spinoza, uh, not Spinoza, sorry, uh, Salazar dictatorship. Yes. Spinola was the general. There, the army did it in a wonderful, totally peaceful way. And it goes to the honor of the army that although they were much more leftist than uh-huh. the result of free elections, they conceded. They calmly right. withdrew themselves. Or uh, these are the tragedies today. Now we are coming to concrete. Uh, yeah. yeah. For example, uh, now I will say something horrible, but I think today we are in such deep shit that there should be no taboos, you know. Uh-huh. Listen, why now? Yeah. Trigger warning, horror is coming. What really makes me sad is, do you remember in... Uh, There were, in past decades, in some Arab countries, popular uprisings, which which, uh, compelled the elite, supported by the army, to allow genuinely free elections, not in any deep Marxist sense, but simply in the sense that people were really free, felt free to vote the way they want. I'm talking here about Egypt, you remember, after the Arab Spring, or already a decade before in Algeria. Yeah. But do you know what happened in both cases? Muslim fundamentalists won. Right. So in Egypt, there was not very totalitarian, but nonetheless very inefficient Muslim Brotherhood uh, regime. And then this was the irony. Those who instigated the revolt against military rule and Mubarak, do you remember, were more or less middle class young intellectuals who were in this new media, blah, blah, blah. And but uh, all of a sudden they found themselves in a minority, socially even more isolated with the new Muslim fundamentalist order. And the result was what? That when the army moved and deposed the Islam, they grudgingly accepted it. And Uh I have friends there. They told me, yeah, this guy, Sisi, who is the boss of Egypt now, it's horrible. But sorry, it was worth it under freely elected fundamentalist rule. It was even worse. Yeah, I wonder... I wonder really? about that. Yeah, I mean, in what sense was it worse, though? I mean, this this is it. it, it in seems... the sense that, at least in our, in uh, okay, I will tell you now sure. something. Okay, I agree. Sorry, I agree with you. 
When yeah. one uses the terms it was worse and so on, yeah. one should be very specific here, you know, yeah. not directly impose our Western uh, uh, ideas or, of freedom. But the last we can establish in the case of Egypt yeah. is that the very, uh, the very force which triggered the revolution then mm-hmm. had to make a pact with those against whom they made the revolution. And I go here to the end in another direction. Now that we are all horrified about what Israeli army is doing in Gaza and elsewhere, West Bank to Palestinians. Yeah. With, with, of course, the cooperation of... Uh... Of of Egypt because it has this you know military uh, you know this military rule that you know gets uh, silent collaboration of all those uh, reactionary Arab states like Saudi Arabia. Here there is one very limited but nonetheless valuable argument not for Israel but against this simple trust in freedom. Look. Okay, Israel horror, blah, blah, blah. But why should it be less horrible? Did you read the news? What now, in the last two years, uh, Saudi Arabia is doing on the border with Yemen? Yeah, oh, there are thousands God, yes. of immigrants, Muslim immigrants. From Somalia, they cross the Red Sea, Yemen try to enter Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has the bombers, helicopters, guns. They simply shoot them down. And it's the same even with uh, Palestinians now. Nobody wants them. Nobody wants them. I'm not, uh, of course, this is horrible, the idea that they should be di- displayed. But uh, how little actual solidarity among the Arab countries there is with Palestinians. But what yeah, I want I to mean, say this is, is, this is, I mean, this is maybe not surprising, Israel, right? Sorry? And this is maybe not surprising, right? I mean, if you think about what those Arab states are, I mean, they, those are, uh, you know, I mean, Saudi Arabia, you know, is uh, is this uh, quasi theocratic. Uh, no, but uh, I, you know, not, I like it in my cynical sense, Saudi Arabia, because it's the most horrible. You know, you don't want that. <laughs> sure, they right? You know, that's corruption uh, to extreme. Yeah. They don't need corruption because the very state is corruption embodied. The, the the king and his family own everything. Yeah. You don't need corruption because mafia family right, 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 right. Owns the state yeah. is beyond corruption. It's, you don't have to violate the laws. <laughs> yeah, well, no, well, this is actually a fun point. I remember uh, this is uh, something I'll bring up sometimes. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago arguing with this uh, – this libertarian about the the social housing uh, system in uh, in Vienna, and he was saying, "Oh, but there's so much you know corruption that you know that like people get ahead of the list because they know somebody." I'm like, okay, but what you want to do is privatize it, which would make corruption redundant, right? It's not like you know, like like the whole thing about corruption is that like corruption is uh, it only arises when you have like legal rules where everybody is supposed yeah. to be treated equally, yeah. rather. Than- yeah. Rather see, that's how we should learn to speak, you know, no taboos. We should admit all these paradoxes. So let's say through some miracle peace with, between Israel and Saudi Arabia, and they, they say, okay, as part of a compromise, let's give back, even if it's not Hamas, Gaza Strip, more fr- to more free Palestinians do what they sure. want. But do you really think I'm not... It's not necessary that they will do their, that they will install there some, in whatever sense, genuine democracy. What if the majority is for some slightly more, in our sense, fundamentalist close? Oh, I'm, I'm sure they, I'm sure the they. Lesson, probably, this is Afghanistan. Look, 20 years or how long of American occupation. And you know what was the miracle? Look at the numbers. The official Afghani army, oh. uh, supported by United States, had three, four times more arms than Taliban. 
they got tremendous amount of money to develop social life, blah, blah. And when the United States left, it simply disintegrated. Yeah, they I mean, it were not disintegrated, ready. disintegrated so I mean, it was it disintegrated so quickly that like literally the uh, the government the United States had left behind couldn't survive long enough for American troops to yeah. make it to the airport. Uh, no, I mean, look, I, I totally take your point. I, I think that if I think that if there were an independent Palestinian state tomorrow, uh, I'm sure a lot of the, uh, you know, <laughs> look, I, I'm obviously somebody who, uh, you know, as a I, you know, I support abortion rights. I support gay rights, yeah. you know, and, I'm, and, and so there would be many, many laws of this state that I wouldn't like. I don't doubt that for a second. But the um, although, of course, uh, you know, people often present this point as if uh, there's, you know, as if somehow right now there were like abortions and gay marriages going on under Israeli occupation in those places, which there aren't either. Right. But they have a. But uh, but yeah, look, I, I do think we should be honest about this. And it's, you know, it's, um, you know, I mean, my position, like, I, I think Israel is an apartheid yeah. state, you know, it's, you know, for, yeah, the last, for the last, you know, 56 years, there have been, uh, you know, millions of people who are subjects, but not citizens, you know, certainly on the West Bank, settlers uh, have, you know, have all the legal rights of, of Israeli citizens, uh, they they could vote in Israeli elections. If they're accused of a crime, they're tried in a regular civilian court. Uh, Palestinians who live mid don't have any of those rights. And, you know, Gaza, I mean, really, I, I think I think we're, we're we're seeing something. I mean, like the overwhelming majority of the population is raised from its homes. Uh, we're, we're seeing something that's really a um, no, no, issue going here. on here. We right? totally agree here. Can I give you another? Well, well but I was just I was going to say, yeah, you know, very quickly, it's like, I also think that sometimes leftists want everything that we think to be treated as if there was like all the same thing. And it's like, no, sometimes, sometimes it's not right. It's like, uh, uh, I, I see these like bizarre signs saying like, Oh, you know, uh, free Palestine is a, you, you know, can't support reproductive justice. You don't support free Palestine and stuff like that. It's like all a little silly. Cause it's like, no, look, I think this is probably mostly a fairly socially conservative religious population. That's okay. People don't have to agree with me on social policy for me what for me to want them not to be brutalized in this way. No, I totally agree with you here, and I will add, I hope you will appreciate it. Another, I think, nice argument from my many links in Israel, from my yeah. friends, Jewish yeah. friends, I learned. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that. On the West Bank, but especially among Israeli Palestinians, Palestinians mm -hmm. who are Israeli citizens because they were there before 67. Yep. You know that, and that's the true dirty secret of Israel that I know. They are systematically, not so much with a brutal violence as mm -hmm. with different subtle pressures, try to, how should I put it? de-intellectualize the enlightened, educated parts of Palestinians. Mm -hmm. They try to throw them out, go to Jordan, go to other countries, whatever. They want the Palestinian population as religiously fundamentalist as, and primitive as possible. And that's mm -hmm. one of the true tragedies there. Palestinians are if I may be a little bit cynical from what I learned, Palestinians oh. are the Jews among the Arabs, the most educated. Even now, I got from some French official data. Do you know that now in Israeli hospitals, there are around 4,000 Palestinian doctors and over 10,000 Palestinian nurses and so on? Mm -hmm. Okay, they use them because they need them now. But their tendency is precisely to keep Palest Palestinians at that, under quotation marks, primitive level. Because as a friend of mine from Palestine told me years ago, now the real tragedy of Palestinians is that in the last decades, the relatively secular mm -hmm. PLO uh, 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 structure disintegrated. 
the choice is now as somebody between Hamas fundamentalism and PLO corruption. Right. Not lack of initiative and so on. And this is not a challenge. This is again the they are doing that Israel at a lower level. The same, you must know it, my old example. The same as uh, British were doing in India. Mm-hmm. They, it's not true. Here I oppose Homi Baba, who said this imitation, Englishman wants everything, everybody to be like them. No, quite on the contrary. From a early 1800s, the British reprinted old, the most fundamentalist Hindu mm-hmm. books mm-hmm. because they discovered that if they remain within their traditional ideology, it will be much easier to dominate Indians. And the, again, Israel is doing the same now. This is a really a, 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 a dirty play. I remember when I was first time 10 years, even more ago, in Ramallah, in Palestine. Mm -hmm. My God, there was normal uh, 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 intellectual, like in any normal city, intellectual atmosphere. There were bookstores where you could get all our books in English and so on, debate clubs and so on and so on. This is all gradually disappearing now. It's a big, big tragedy. And now... To conclude, would you swallow this? You know sure. what I'm saying? I Here, I wonder if you would agree. I'm not saying this traditional and for me wrong theoretical uh, or theoretical political judgment. I'm not saying, okay, maybe they went a little bit too far, but what Hamas did there was part of a brutal guerrilla warfare uh. and so on and so on. No, I don't buy that. You must know what. And here I am just one step from people who were slaughtered there in those kibbutzes uh, in the south by Hamas. You know that they were the most progressive. I know people who knew them. You know that they were the most progressive part. They constantly were in contact with Gaza Arabs, bringing blah, blah, blah. And uh, this is why. I think that's the tragedy that uh, now I'm speaking like a Stalinist objectively as to its social function. The Hamas slaughter served perfectly the interest of the of this new messianic Jewish fundamentalists, Ben Gwir, Smotrich, and so on. Because can I now tell my dirty story for which we will be both arrested? I, they published it somewhere, but it got lost. Maybe in Philosophical Salon. I, uh, maybe, okay, our listeners, I'm sure, don't know this story. You remember, I mentioned the movie Ghost by Ivan yes. McGregor, Pierce Bronsner, you remember? Well, sure. it's a nice political thriller and... Uh, a journalist is at the end killed because he discovered something. What? That the ex prime minister of the United States, modeled upon Tony Blair, uh-huh. was from his youth educated as a CIA agent to take over as British prime minister. The idea was that he should be a little bit to the left, Labour Party. But in foreign policy, totally pro-American. And as the reviewer said, of course, this is in all probability not true. Yeah. But in a way, if it were to be true, it would render clear everything. <laughs> so this fiction which explains everything. And my point would have been, permit me the dirty story, my favor, that it's horror. And again, to calm our listeners and uh. viewers. I know this is not true, what I will say now, but that's, I think, the objective logic. I'm not saying Hamas and the Israel messianic fundamentalists are really on the same side connected, but they are caught in a deadly tango supporting each other. 
Okay, so I constructed a fiction of how maybe came to this attack. I imagined one of these ultra hardliners, messianic hardliners, yeah. Israel phoning Hamas to Gaza. Yeah. Say, how you remember us? We supported you financially so that you are as strong now as you are, which incidentally, do you know, it's a fact. Uh, yeah, there's that there's that clip of uh, of of, of Smotrich, I think he says openly Netanyahu said a couple of times yes that it was Israeli policy that the only way really to prevent the the two state solution is to keep Palestinians divided. Right. So for them PLO was too, PLO was too secular. So we need a fundamentalist counterpoint. The same incidentally that uh, United States did in Afghanistan. <laughs> no Taliban without previous American super. Okay. So this fundamentalist said, you remember we gave you money because Israel was for over a decade with millions of dollars financing Hamas. Just to keep Palestinians speech. So, okay, let's go on with that conversation. Like the Israeli you know, fundamentalist guy says, listen, yeah. uh, uh, you remember, you owe us, now we ask you for a small favor. And Hamas guy says, okay, what favor? And Israeli guy said, why don't you make an attack somewhere in the south close to Gaza, kill a couple of hundred people? This would serve us perfectly. Why? We have two problems in Israel with the fundamentalists. On the one hand, you remember what went on a month ago. Israel was on the verge of a revolt, hundreds of thousands demonstrating against the fundamentalists for the independent court system and so on and so on. So the idea was, uh, says this, Israeli fundamentalists to Hamas, oh, yeah. if you do this, it will be war tension, national unity, and all the demonstrations will be over, which incidentally is true now, you know. Right. Slowly, but it's true. And then he says, uh, uh, this uh, Israeli guy, also, we need victims on our side. People have to be slaughtered. Why? So that we can again play the game of we Jews are victims, so that the focus will be on your slaughter there, and we can finish nicely in faster way the ethnic cleansing on the West Bank which is also going on now in an incredibly accelerated rhythm. Then uh, 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 the Hamas representative says, yes, of course, slaughter the Jews, my God, we'll do it glad. Uh -huh. yeah? Because the Israeli guy says, you know, those people that you will slaughter there, they are half friends of Palestinians. We also don't care. Right, 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 then right, right. the Hamas guy says, but please promise us another thing. As a revenge, will you bomb us heavily, killing thousands, especially of children, because this will make anti-Semitism explode and so on, you know, and like it will help us in this new constellation. And the Israeli guy answers, okay, that's good, because a new wave of anti-Semitism fits us also, so that we can play the victim again, you know by anti-Semitism and go on with our total defense. And then one of them concludes the talk with the famous quote, my version of Casablanca. Let's hope this is the beginning of a beautiful hatred, not friendship. But listen, isn't this, this yeah. didn't happen. It's sure, of course. an obscene right. fantasy. But isn't this effectively the logic of it? Both sides like this, like the results. Hamas, I think, is, of course, they knew they will not win. Right. But what they wanted, and they succeeded triumphantly, is triggering a new wave of anti-Semitism. It's a worldwide phenomenon. Israel, among the ordinary people, even in the West, Israel is losing. You are bombarded by all those shots from Gaza and by quite touching details. For example, the one that even affected me. You know what are now doing children in Gaza? 
mm-hmm. children who are already not grown up, but like who can do this eight, 10 years. They carve with a knife deeply into the skin of their uh, arm, uh, their name, because they count that they will die and so that they can be recognized who they are. Like this is pretty sad, admit it, no? Yeah. So, I think that, and that's what I'm trying to tell to enlightened Israelis. Yes, Israel still may win militarily, because let's be serious, Hamas, and even if Hezbollah joins Hamas, they cannot really militarily beat Israel. What they can do is give an incredible boost to anti-Semitism. I mean, I mean, what... Exploding around the world. Did you read that news in Dagestan? Some no. small... Uh, oh, I know what you're talking about, the airport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. On airport, local crazy people were looking for Jewish passengers to link right. them and so on. And, you know, people are sensitive to these concrete details, images of suffering. And yeah. now we get... That's where I don't get, except in my paranoiac scenario, why is Israel doing what they are doing in such a way as if to guarantee an explosion of anti-Semitism? Well, I mean, look, I don't, I don't think that they, I, as you kind of said in your hypothetical phone call, uh, I don't think, I don't think that the uh, Israeli government particularly uh, minds anti-Semitism. In fact, uh, I think anti-Semitism abroad is good for them because they, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, because it drives immigration to Israel. It has, uh, it's, uh, it justifies the existence of Israel, you know, it's, uh, you know, ideologically and rhetorically. Uh, so, uh, you know, that makes sense. But I mean, like, I, I guess the, the question is, and, you know, I, I will say, right, I mean, I think that- Please. Clearly in Dagestan, right? Then, like, that's some real serious over the top anti Semitism. Uh, in you know, in a lot of Western countries, uh, I mean, especially, but don't forget about BRICS, the third world. How Putin and all those guys are profiting, you know, Uh, this is breathtaking for me. But, but, but I I can I put to you, I would like to hear your reaction. Another crazy idea, yeah. I think that if Trump wins, yeah. the United States will become another BRICS country. <laughs> you know, in what sense? You know what's the BRICS idea? No world-like solidarity, each country full sovereignty. I tolerate your dirty things, you tolerate my dirty things, you know. yeah. I I'm... think that in this sense, not in the sense of formal union, uh, Trump's vision is more isolationist. In well, the it's not. Yeah, it's not like, I mean, the Trump's not an isolationist the way that people think he was, because um, there is all this revisionist history about this where, you know, Republicans will say, oh, you know, Trump, uh, you know, kept the peace. He kept us out of wars. It's like, no, Trump uh, ripped up the nuclear deal with Iran. He assassinated Soleimani. He doubled the rate of drone strikes in Yemen. Uh, he uh, he moved the uh, the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem to like take that off the table for any kind of future two state settlement. Uh, and even the Abraham Accords. I mean, the whole point of that was to uh, you know, because it's not like there was some war between Saudi Arabia and Israel that was happening beforehand. Uh, it just for you know it, but formalizing the alliance. The whole point of that was to freeze out the Palestinians forever. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, so I think that like in you know. I think that in many ways, I mean, uh, Trump uh, and, you know, he he came close to starting a war with North Korea. Everybody's forgotten that. Right. But they have at the end. My God, he almost brought, I wouldn't say a semblance of peace. But did you notice how after Trump's crazy interventions, meeting Kim and so on, at least in the last five, six years, North Korea, you remember, for a year or two, we were all obsessed by it. Yes. Maybe it will begin again, but then somehow it's off the table, you know, North Korea. Yeah, so yeah. Well, North- I, mean, I mean, Trump did both, right? He he brought the tensions higher than they'd ever they'd been in decades. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he had a, you know, change of heart, you know, and, uh, and he backed down. But so, you know, Trump was an isolationist in that sense. But I do know what you're saying, right? That Trump was... Uh, was and is very um, 
you know, he, he really dispenses with the sort of fiction that like, oh, we've got this rules based order since, you know, World War II and yeah, we yeah. have this national system. Uh, you know, he, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't care, care about any of that. So like, even though of course, uh, you know, in a way the U S under Trump would be even less of a BRICS country. Cause I think that he might escalate, uh, yeah. you know, the new cold war with China, uh, yeah. even, you know, even more than it has been, et cetera. You know, I, I do, I do know what you're saying. There is this sort of, there is this like Frank transactionalism about Trump. Like, uh, like, you know, one of his objections to the Iraq war was like, Oh, why didn't we take the oil? You know, that, that was a, it was a bad deal. Right. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know. No, but, see, but you know, speaking about this, I agree totally about this new populist with your point, but at this level yeah. in Europe are ultra depressed by what happened now in Netherlands. The elections, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. that, and this is an extremely dangerous phenomenon. Basically, I think it's uh, the end of. Now I'm becoming a self-critical pessimist, as you know. Maybe we disagreed here. I still sure. had some crazy hope. Maybe Europe can do something. Now I'm a much more of a pessimist. Europe had in the last year a double fiasco. The first fiasco was this series of populist victories, yeah. which basically mean that European Union is inoperative. Uh, and uh, I think this will go on. Maybe Le Pen in uh, uh, France and so on. In, in England, it's for me a catastrophe. I don't know how much you follow the situation, but at a recent talk in London, I somebody asked me, what do you think about political situation in England? I said yeah. a very interesting one. You have a big centrist conservative party, which is called Labour Party, moderate, right? Yeah, and then yeah, yeah. You have a conservative party, which is... Um, uh, uh, right-wing fringe lunatics and so on, you know, it's like the left is totally marginalized right. but back to Wilders you know yeah. where I think is his and, 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 I sh and I should say though by the way, just to connect the topics that the yeah. that um, you know, you talked earlier about global anti-Semitism and trust me you know, I yeah. don't have to be convinced that that exists but, they, uh, but there is also uh, you know, I mean, if you're talking about Dagestan, yes, that's like very clear anti-Semitism, yeah. but there's also, um, there's also, I mean, as you well know, right, given your experiences, the Frankfurt Books Fair, et cetera, right, there, there is also this huge problem of, um, of, of crying wolf about anti-Semitism, of, uh, of people, of, uh, of hostility towards, uh, the, you know, ethnic cleansing in West Bank and Gaza and Western support. They for it. You know, keep be, 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 I agree with you. Semitism, right? That that's a, and and the and that's how that's a big part of how the left was marginalized in the UK. That the uh, the uh, the spurious accusations of uh, of anti-Semitism, you know, were used to help defeat the you know Corbyn leadership in uh, in yeah, in no, the, no. Uh, yeah in the in the you know in the Labour Party. So I mean, it's it's both. Um, you know, and like even even in like the uh, like the in the U.S. right, the Anti Defamation League, they keep this like uh, this running tab of like list of numbers of like anti Semitic incidents. And uh, there was an article about this in the Intercept. They were counting uh, and uh, demonstrations against uh, the Israeli bombing in Gaza that were organized by Jewish peace groups as anti Semitic incidents for the sake of you know of their their tabulation, right? I mean that's that's exactly how far a lot of the perceptions sure, I, of anti Semitism is, detached what you from reality. Said now is perfect. It's precisely the other side of the same. Uh, uh, that is to say that how and this is I think again. If anything, contributing to anti-Semitism in resistance groups, this totally crazy criminalization that, like, if you just say, sorry, guys, Palestinians are also, su also suffering. Yeah. What, what, again, uh, uh, a guy, Halevi, the ex-boss of Mossad, 
says every minimally intelligent guy says without true equality and deal with Palestinians there will not be peace there if you say this and it's not just you know small attacks here and there we are talking it's approaching mostly in Germany but Germany is the model here they have old Nazi traditions they now just resuscitate them in the know, you, you, you see that the uh, that uh uh, that when Bernie Sanders was in Germany, the uh, uh, to promote his new book, the uh, the head of the Social Democratic Party uh, uh, posted that she wasn't going to go see him because uh, because she was disgusted by his criticisms of uh, of Israeli bombing in Gaza. So, like you know, one of the most prominent Jewish politicians in the world is being boycotted by you know, or like his event has been boycotted by oh, uh, the, I mean, the head of the Social I mean, Democratic yes. Party. Yeah. Can I, this is perfect to conclude. Yeah. Can I, uh, maybe yeah. you found it in some marginally, I mean, uh, sure, I sure. totally agree with you because do you know that I am now more and more prohibited? Like the moment I touched in my last text, Gaza, Palestine and all that, I'm cut off only one marginal weekly journal, Freitag, Friday. Mm -hmm. From time to time publishes me, but they always had to take care that then there is a reply to me to which I hope I can reply. It's, it's a terror, but you know, a wonderful story, your readers should look into it. There is a German Jewish lady, do you know the story, called Deborah, Deborah Forman, who is a German Jew. She is Jewish, but a dual citizenship, German and Israeli. Okay. And he is, uh, of course, not anti-Semitic, but for peace there. Right. He says, okay, Hamas, unacceptable, but sorry, what we are doing now, killing thousands of children, blah, blah. Okay. She was a criticized, isolated, all that. And then, because she was relatively well-known, it's a beautiful detail, like Lacanian, a sleep of right. tongue. She was at a round table with some uh, she didn't name them not to embarrass him to her, with some uh, Green Party member of the government. Yeah. And she asked him, listen, uh, uh, ah, the title of her text, you will like it. It is, it's very easy to, to be a Jew in Germany, but not if you are a Jew critical of Israel. <laughs> right, right. She is treated in some sense as an inner traitor of Israel in some sense even worse than uh, Arab immigrants who are supposed to be right, right. racist, blah, blah. But uh, the nice detail is this one. So she asked this minister, listen, but look at my situation. Do I have the freedom to say what I think? And I'm not alone. There are hundreds of others. You know what's the answer she got? She was shocked. Uh. The minister said, it's too complex. I cannot go into your problem while sie sind nicht rein Deutsch. You are not purely German. <laughs> and then she, you know what's important here? She looked into Wikipedia, the media. And of course, the minister just wanted to say, uh, you are not purely German, you know. You are mixed German, Jew, Jew, and city. But the term he used, she discovered that uh, the usual is you are of mixed nationality, blah, blah. The term Rhein Deutsch was used only by the Nazis. <laughs> so, so it's ingenious. So, you know, the minister on behalf of fighting anti Semitism use the term Rhein Deutsch, which was, and then there is another step here, which I found disgusting. Oh. Uh, 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 how, uh, how now the, something much more ominous even is popular in Germany, the thesis on so-called importierter antisemitismus, imported antisemitism. The idea is this one. Yeah, there is a new way of antisemitism now in Germany. But it doesn't come really from us Germans. It's the foreigners, Arabs, who yeah. live in our midst that they did it. 
in other way in in other words they are even trying to blame now for anti like it's not us it's they who who brought it here and so on the situation is absolutely horrible people yeah. for one wrong sometimes literally for one wrong word okay another example i will give you now it's criminalized to say from the river to the sea palestina shall be free okay we know why because the true slogan is now being actualized from the river to the sea israel i want to say something else i know this slogan you know whose slogan this was at the origin ah. the two state the one state solution slogan why don't we all live in binational free state originally this was not a palestinian fundamentalist slogan the point was not throw them into the sea or whatever and how they totally falsified or another thing oh yes BD, I, bds which, yeah boycott divest i know this i had some problems in europe but i know this was in israel it began as a mix there were almost more jews in this bds movement than uh, palestinians all of a sudden i don't know how, how is it in the united states but in germany it's not just that it's not tolerated it's now officially proclaimed a criminal act yeah it's it's, it's, getting, it's getting close to that in the united states i mean that can't happen outright you know because the first amendment but there are a number of states uh, uh that have uh laws against anybody who like works for a company that does business with the state you know uh being involved in bds etc that really stretch the limits of what you can do constitutionally uh to free speech but yeah i mean i, mean, I think that your point about the river to the sea is really important because uh don't get me wrong if uh if things change politically so that there was actually a possibility of a two-state solution I would certainly accept that as like the most justice that was, you know, that was possible politically and, you know, not make the yeah. perfect enemy of the good. But also if you accept certain kinds of basic liberal democratic principles that, uh, that in other contexts, most people in Western societies would accept, then, uh, then that kind of uh, one state solution would be what you would end up endorsing. You know that many Israelis and Palestinians who are officially publicly for two-state solution then privately said exactly like you said they said this would meant just freezing the divisions but the only authentic solution and i had with them very frank conversations and we said of course you never know what can happen some safety valves or how should be built into it like you know, one nation shouldn't rule exclusively to somehow enforce a coalition. Maybe, why not? Because Jews were so molested, Holocaust and so on to say the prime minister or president should be in principle a Jew or what. It can be done. Sure. Like in Lebanon, before the catastrophe, there was such an unwritten rule, you know. So again, all I'm saying is I am not an idiot. I am not saying no. who disband Israeli secret services, open the borders. No, there are fundamentalist Arabs and so on. But I agree totally with you here. The only authentic solution would have been this. And Israel has now a very dark plan. They even, well, no, it's not even dark, it's public. Yeah. They didn't already annex West Bank because then the problem would be you have to give them voting rights. Right. So the plan is now to limit the Palestinian presence in the West Bank, to throw them out to three, basically, around area around Jenin, around Nablus, Hebron, they're already ethnically cleansing Hebron, and around Ramallah. And this then become literally some kind of Bantustan ghettos and so on. And of course, as such, they don't have voting rights and so on and so on. At the same time, you 
push them outside of the country as many as possible. But, uh, uh, and another thing to conclude, would you agree yes. with me uh, that, uh, I'm not, I don't mean this in an authentic sense, oh, yeah. a true emancipatory movement you cannot destroy, but in a much more vulgar way, mm. you cannot totally annihilate Hamas. Oh, because, totally. Yes, I, I think it's absurd to say the leaders, that. Many of them will find a way to escape. They will just reorganize, become even more brutal elsewhere. Yes. Intelligent Israelis are repeating this. No matter how ruthless it is, uh, violent destruction of Hamas will not do the job. No, no. no. It will not even do the job of destroying Hamas. Yes, absolutely. I mean, this, this, this is, and so on. Yeah. No, this is crazy. I mean, that's like like the the way that everybody in mainstream Western discourse talks about this as if eliminating Hamas is a possible outcome of uh, of this. I mean, look, as Israeli propaganda itself emphasizes, the top leadership of Hamas isn't even in Gaza; they're in Qatar. So uh, that's uh, they're not going to be eliminated. Uh, okay. they, it's, and, and certainly, you know, when you look at a situation like this, where, you know, last numbers I saw out of, you know, estimates about the total population of Gaza, I see like 2.2 or 2.3 million out of those, uh, 1.8 million have been displaced from their homes, uh, since, uh, since this started, uh, there has been, I mean, the numbers are, uh, the numbers of uh, of deaths are absolutely staggering. I mean, like you know, there are, there are more uh, thousands more people have been killed in Gaza than were killed in Iraq in two thousand and three. Uh, mm-hmm. It's 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 uh, several thousand larger larger than uh, the confirmed numbers in Ukraine. I understand a lot of people think that that's a uh, the real numbers are much higher, but they have a but uh, but you know, given that. I mean, I don't understand a scenario where that wouldn't lead as, I mean, this is what you're saying, right? To, to yeah, massive yeah. future recruitment for, for Hamas. I mean, this is, I mean, look, you know, Hamas is terrible. I have zero sympathy for, uh, for, for Hamas, but, uh, but, you know, Hamas is going to exist until the conditions that yeah, lead young Palestinian men to join Hamas yeah. are changed. I mean, I, I I just don't see any possible way around that. So then the question is, well, if that's not it, what would actually count as Israel's quote unquote winning, right? What would winning be? And also, it's even more prohibited to say what I said a couple of times, that I don't justify Hamas, but... Sure. The, what I would have done, yes, I would try to fight Hamas, But at the same time, especially on the West Bank, I would make a mega move if I were Israel. No, you are guaranteed, give them new rights and so on. To make this clear, without this, well, as I wrote already in my Frankfurt speech, Palestinians are not even given a clear option now. They are living some limbo existence without any firm promises, do this, do that. They are literally pushing them into Hamas. Do they have any other... Op- because now I'll make a point that you will, I hope, like. Mm-hmm. You know, in present state... I'm so sorry. I'm disgusting, disgusted, even my, me, by myself. But in... Uh, You know, did you notice how now there is a slight shift in the opinion in the sense that it's permitted to say, yeah, 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 we are for Israel, but my God, they suffer a lot, Palestinians, can we limit their suffering? But there is something so hypocritical in it. Palestinians are good if they just suffer as victims. Isn't it natural that you that you resist? I mean, some pro-Palestinian guy wonderfully quote, quoted, he's not my favorite person because he was against Haiti nonetheless, Thomas Jefferson, who said yeah. something like, when there is justice, you should obey it. When there is injustice, you resist. Yes. They are pushing the Palestinians into this, and that's the point of my disgusting phone call imagination yeah well look look pushing them into this 
they 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 want this no it's yeah harder. absolutely and also palestinians know this terrible partiality of western european reaction for example do you know this argument it was made i think in the united nations by the palestinian representative very simple point you remember when russians were bombing electricity and so on in uh, ukrainian cities yes yep they immediately proclaimed this a war crime mm-hmm. immediately uh, what about israel doing exactly the same with even worse consequences in in uh, in gaza yeah i mean this is the uh i saw on breaking points uh crystal ball put together this montage of uh Anthony Blinken of uh, of Kirby of all these different uh, U.S. officials, uh, where this, the very same official would talk about uh, Russia and uh, in Ukraine, and they would uh, they would make uh, they would make very clear statements. These are outrageous war crimes. Which, by the way, just so nobody gets this wrong, I agree with. I think it was right, but they have a, but then uh, but then they would uh, that and then she would play next to it the clip of the same person um, saying, well, it's war, civilians are going to die, maybe Israel's gone too far, but I'm not going to play judge and jury about that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, that's popular here. All of a sudden, it's big <laughs> skepticism. Yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Now it's like, oh, who's to say? You know, it's, uh, you know, it's but like... this really worries me. You know why? Because, about. as my friends are telling me, as I wrote... In global geopolitical space, the biggest loser here will be Europe, I think. It, the, it, till now, till the last two years, Europe played a relatively positive role. You know why? I mm-hmm. was in Israel privately, I mean, and then make a talk in Ramallah, yes. but I stayed with the Slovene ambassador, who was a nice lady, very progressive. And he yeah. told me that Israeli foreign ministry officials told him, we simply discount, we don't like European Union, you just support Palestinians, which is true. You know that the biggest financial support for the function of PLA, PLO comes from Europe. So they did play this game a little bit. Now it's a fiasco. Most of the country, and okay, Macron tried a little bit, but what Germans are doing, it's a nightmare. You know, would you agree with this characterization yeah. that I use? It's as if uh, German logic is this one. We did something horrible, a big crime against the Jews, but to exculpate ourselves, we now support the Jews when they are doing a similar Right, 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 right. exactly. That's and, and the even, yeah. of it. Yeah, no. It's like they they haven't. There's no stopping it. Just not being racist. It's just having. You know, it just has to be directed at different. And my point here is a very pathetic one, as I will put in the new text. Yeah. Sorry, this is not true love of the Jews. True love of uh, if you are my true friend, precisely in order to save you, I will criticize you when I think you are doing wrong. Right. Europe is doing exactly the wrong way in this way, especially Germany, contributing to anti-Semitism and so on. The world is shit. That's well, why I like quantum physics. All <laughs> 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 waves are collapsing. Well, Who cares? <laughs> well, there are, uh, we're not going to be able to come up with a better note to end this on than that one. So uh, the book is Freedom, a uh, Disease Without Cure, uh, I I know uh, this is going to make you uncomfortable because you don't like being praised, but no. uh, consistently, uh, whenever I read you, uh, I even where I disagree, it always makes me think, and uh, and I really enjoy the experience. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I said something, and also I call people to listen to you because in this total confusion of the left, either they are lost in the straps of political correctness or they or they either buy the western notion of human rights or think that praising Hamas is anti-colonial struggle and so on. Although, you know what's the latest news that I read? Yeah. These crazy Israeli fundamentalists claim 
know that it, the state of Israel is the greatest decolonization story of all times. That those who were thrown out by occupiers, they now return its recolonization. It's uh, uh, no recolonization. It's sorry. decolonization. It's, yeah, yeah. Well, well, this is, this is the thing. Settlers are the true indigenous people. <laughs> yes, which is, you know, and it's like, I will say, though, right, like that uh, – Obviously, that's insane. But the part that I think that some leftists don't like to hear that I think is true yeah. is that um, is that I think thinking about that should really lead people to question why this category of like who counts as indigenous or whatever is important in the first place. Right. That In other words, absolutely. You know, that's that, the crucial thing what you mentioned now. This is absolutely crucial. Because, because why? Like you know, when like people do all these uh, sort of well-meaning Western liberals, you know, want to do like start meetings with you know land acknowledgments. You know, these are the traditional lands of the you know uh, you know Cherokee people, whatever. And it's like, well, hold on. Um, obviously, the uh, the the uh, atrocities committed against Native Americans were terrible. But saying that this is like in some essential sense, this is the land of this or that group, uh, I have to say, I mean, look, I mean, as a, just just from a sort of old fashioned communist sort of perspective, I don't like that. That's a, uh, you know, blood and soil nationalism of the oppressed is still blood and soil nationalism. Absolutely agree. This is, you see, that's why I love you. You are not afraid to say these things. And in today's situation, because it's so desperate and complex, we should never sacrifice intellectual honesty on behalf of some pragmatic consideration. We'll deserve the enemy on and so on. Right. We don't have time to play those games anymore. I am really grateful to you. All right. Well, and thank you. I hope to meet you at some point. And the last time, was it in Hey on Why? When we uh, yes. ate those disgusting hamburgers. So, <laughs> yes. another hamburger. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, I uh, look forward to the next, uh, the next uh, gross, okay. gross Welsh Thanks hamburger. Very much, my friend. All right, thank you so much, Slava. You have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument. To access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron-exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron-exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more, go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish. <laughs>